December 20th, 1990. The whole sky is up. We thought there was a nuclear explosion. Oh, my God, it's terrible. And then fire. And then the whole thing was done. It was two years ago tomorrow that Pan Am Flight 103 was blown out of the sky. The work sources say a fifth Palestinian extremist. Where is he now? Safe and sound. Sheltered by the United States U.S. ally in the Mideast, Syria's Hafez al-Assad. Tonight, the true story of Pan Am Flight 103. We'll take you step by step through the secret terrorist meetings and the security lapses that led to the tragedy over Lockheed. How the American government failed to publicize a detailed bomb warning. And what changes have been made since. How Pan Am seemed more interested in PR than costly security. And are the skies any safer today? 270 people were killed. Many of their families and friends are still asking, how could it have happened? You people in the government couldn't care less because they weren't your kids. The mistake was not letting everybody else know. Why weren't they told? Answers to that question and others tonight as we piece together the players and events that brought down Pan Am Flight 103. From ABC News, with anchors Diane Sawyer, Sam Donaldson, Chief Correspondent Chris Wallace, Judd Rose, Jay Shadler, Sylvia Chase, and Pierre Salinger. This is Prime Time. Prime Time. Now from New York, Sam Donaldson. Good evening. Diane is off tonight. Tonight we have new information on one of the worst terrorist attacks in recent memory, the bombing of Pan Am Flight 103. It was this time two years ago, December 21st, 1988, that the plane was blown out of the sky above Lockerbie, Scotland, killing 270 people. Tonight we'll bring you up to date on everything that's happened since our original investigation, which we aired a year ago, and in which we named Palestinian extremist Ahmed Jabril as the mastermind. Ironically, in the past few months, the man who's been Jabril's biggest supporter, Syrian President Hafez al-Assad, has become a close ally of the United States in the Persian Gulf crisis. And in the last year, more pieces of the puzzle have come together. The Czechoslovakian government admitted the former regime there made and sold the plastic explosive Semtex, something we reported. And it turns out they even went so far as to test Semtex to see exactly how much was needed to bring down a plane. Also, after months of painstaking work, Investigators were able to reconstruct large parts of the Boeing 747, confirming what we told you. The bomb had been placed in the left forward cargo hold, 14L, with luggage from Frankfurt. We'll bring you the latest on what's been done to prevent another such terrorist attack. What's happened to those believed responsible for the bombing? And what's happened to the families of some of the victims? But first, we'll trace the events that led to the Pan Am tragedy. An ABC News team has been on the story for two years. Judd Rose looked at the warning. Chief Correspondent Chris Wallace covered Pan Am security. And Chief Foreign Correspondent Pierre Salinger, who led our investigation, contacted forces in the terrorist network. We begin with Pierre. It is a bright spring day in Athens, April 2nd, 1986. It signals a sudden change in the tactics of world terrorism. Today, a bomb ripped through the hull of TWA 840. It is on this tarmac of the Athens airport that the world discovered that Arab terrorists had moved to high technology. They had discovered it was getting more and more difficult to put guns aboard planes for hijacking, and they moved to the sophisticated equipment. The Arab revolutionary cells take credit for the bombing, which killed four people. One of the victims, a four-month-old baby. The bomb that exploded on TWA 840, like the bomb on Pan Am 103, was hidden in a suitcase and got through airport security. The bomb was made with a sensitive barometric sensor, activated at a preset altitude, and a carefully built electronic detonator which ignited a thin layer of Semtex, a highly powerful state-of-the-art explosive commonly used by terrorists. In the months to come, Palestinian terrorists try again and again. They try and fail to put a bomb on this El Al jet in London, a suitcase where the bomb explodes too early at this terminal in Madrid. Many terrorists, some Iranians, some Palestinians, are responsible for much of this slaughter. 
But this is also a crucial time for one specific terrorist. Ahmed Jabril, leader of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine General Command, PFLPGC, a radical, violent Palestinian group which buys with other radical groups for money and prestige. He is the man who will orchestrate the downing of Pan Am 103, a man who believes terrorism draws attention to the Palestinian cause. He is 52 years old and was born near what is now Tel Aviv. He fled his home during the 1948 war and hated Israel ever since. He formed his own Palestinian terrorist group 20 years ago and is now a bitter enemy of Yasser Arafat, the head of the PLO, who he feels is too moderate. December 1986, the hills outside Massa. Primetime Live has been told by several intelligence services of an elaborate secret plan that begins with a meeting here. And Ahmed Jabril says that he wants to bring down an airplane. At that meeting is Hafez al Kamuni, Jabril's deputy. He is 43 years old and also left his home during the war with Israel. Wounded in a terrorist attack, he blames Israeli doctors for unnecessarily amputating his leg. He was imprisoned by Israel for more than 10 years and rejoined Jabril to take charge of all terrorist operations in Europe. The other man at the meeting, Marwan Kresat, master bomb maker. He is 44 years old and was born in Jordan. He joined Jabril in 1968 and built his first bomb at age 23. In 1972, one of his bombs blew a hole in an El Al jet leaving Rome. Encouraged about squabbles in the terrorist movement, he quit in 1973 only to come back 13 years later. In late December 1986, Kreisat is sent to this market at the map, ordered by Jabril to make more sophisticated bombs inside five Toshiba cassette recorders, like the devices that will blow up Pan Am 103. As shown in these official police photos obtained by Primetime Live, Kreisat builds the bombs by removing some of the original wiring and circuits, replacing them with detonators and explosives. September 1987, Kreisat is ordered back to this neighborhood in Damascus to take the bombs apart and ship the timers to Europe, where they will soon be needed. <laughs> Meanwhile, Jabril's forces remain in Syria, launching terrorist attacks against Israel, operating with the full knowledge of the Syrian government, and relying on Libya for its funding. And Jabril anxiously waits for a chance to earn more cash for his operation by demonstrating the power of a new bomb. Soon, the United States will give him that chance. This is Chris Wallace. The increased terrorism in the spring of 86 forces Pan American Airlines to take drastic action. Business on some Pan Am routes falls by 50%. To win back frightened travelers, Pan Am establishes its own alert security company be partially financed by a $5 surcharge on each transatlantic ticket. We at Pan Am are determined to provide a secure environment for our passengers. Fred Ford is Alert's first president, and within weeks he grows concerned that Pan Am is more interested in public relations than real security. I thought that any system that its basic level of defense was a group of employees that took their job no more serious than flipping hamburgers at McDonald's was not a very good system. For example, when Alert starts operations at New York Kennedy Airport in June, Pan Am orders that dogs be paraded in front of its check-in counter. But the dogs are not what they seem. They were not farm flipping dogs. What were they? They were your... Um, well-behaved German shepherds. Where did Pan Am get them? They leased them from a kennel in Long Island. Pan Am did more than create its own security firm. The airline then hired an outside consultant to review its operation here in Frankfurt and in 24 other airports around the world. That consultant was called KPI, and it did more than just find fault with Pan Am. It recommended a whole new security system. Protecting the passengers, Isaac Yepet, a former security chief for El Al Airlines, inspects Pan Am stations in Europe for KPI. In a confidential report to Pan Am obtained by Primetime Live, KPI finds problems system-wide, including 
Pan Am is highly vulnerable to most forms of terrorist attack. The report specifically notes a bomb would have a good chance of getting through security in Frankfurt, West Germany. Geffert says his advice in the summer of 86 is blunt. Don't rely on your life. Just build a bit security if you don't want to see disaster. There are other warnings. In July of 86, alert President Fred Ford write this confidential memo to Pan Am, warning the new security system is certainly not what we have advertised. It could be a very significant embarrassment to us all. Pan Am refused repeated requests for an interview, but its reaction to these warnings is clear. Ford is dismissed as security chief. Pan Am fired you because you wanted more security? I was unwilling to uh, back off of my commitment to seeing that program through in the manner that it was originally presented. And Pan Am also rejects KPI's recommendation, saying they are too expensive and that Pan Am can run its own security system. As Wallace said, we've repeatedly asked Pan Am officials for an interview and the decline. We now introduce you to Ahmed Jabril, the radical Palestinian behind the destruction of Pan Am Flight 103. He told you about Pan Am's seemingly superficial security effort. When we come back, revenge, the motive for the attack on Flight 103, after the U.S. mistakenly shoots down an Iranian Airbus, killing 290 people. Iran and Iraq are at war. U.S. military ships are patrolling the Persian Gulf to keep the waterway open for oil tankers. The American cruiser Vincennes has been engaged in a running firefight with Iranian naval forces. On July 3rd, the captain and crew are at the battle station. Pierre Salinger picks up the story of a tragic mistake that would echo five months later over the skies of Scotland. On board the USS Vincennes, sailors look at the Aegis computer system, misread the size, speed, and altitude of the Iranian Airbus. They think the plane to be an F-14 fighter jet, descending. Coming inbound fast. Possibly preparing for an attack. The USS Vincennes fires twice. 290 people were aboard Flight 655. None survived. To the United States, it is all a dreadful mistake. To many Iranians, it is calculated, cold-blooded murder. Weaving angry crowds jam Iran's streets and its cemetery of martyrs shouting for vengeance. Iran's leader, Rafsanjani, says publicly that Iran is not interested in revenge. But behind the scenes is the thirst for just that and the chance Jabril has been waiting for. Primetime Live has learned that in the summer of 88, Jabril goes to Iran to negotiate with Ali Akbar Motoshemi, once Iran's ambassador to Syria, at the time Iran's interior minister. Their agreement is simple. Destroy one American plane. The price tag, $10 million. In fact, according to the deputy chief of the PLO, Ahmed Jibril had been courting Iran and its terrorists, the Hezbollah, for some time. The relationship between Iran and Jibril really got started in 1982, especially through Mohtashani, who was Iran's ambassador to Syria. August 1988. Jabril's group is now printing false passports like these to make it easier to move their operatives around. And in Syria, it is a time for planning. Increase that, the master bomb builder is summoned again. Yellow Kamuni called him in to one of the base camps here in Syria. He told him, we're about to launch a major operation. He also told him, that Libya was cutting off the financial aid to their organization, but that they had found a new sponsor, Iran. Jabril's first step, buying the explosives. Primetime Live has learned that Jabril used agents with Libyan connections to buy explosives from this plant in Czechoslovakia. Jabril buys Semtex, the easily concealed plastic explosive. Then the explosives are moved into position from Czechoslovakia to Libya where it is divided. Some is shipped to Beirut. Del Camuni, Jabril's deputy, smuggles it by car into West Germany. Other shipments are sent to the PFLPGC agents in Yugoslavia and Bulgaria. Kresat, the master bomb maker, is ordered to West Germany. Our target is there, he is told, and we will not fail.
This is Chris Waller. With the terrorist threat increasing in the fall of 88, security at one of Pan Am's high-risk stations, Frankfurt, West Germany, is in the hands of 29-year-old Ulrich Weber. Funtime Live has learned that the man in charge of this sensitive post, unknown to Pan Am, has a criminal record for passing bad checks in the U.S. in 1981. And Weber surrounds himself in Frankfurt with people like Sabine Foo, who have no experience. Just as usual. I was a hairdresser. After you were hired, how much training did you have? Kind of. None. None whatsoever. No training? It's a hard time training. No training at all. So with no prior experience and no training, what job were you doing? Your mind? I was called a screener. A screener is an airline's front line of defense, checking to see if any passengers fit the profile for possible terrorists. Faber also hired Simona Keller to work in Frankfurt Security, and he quickly promoted her. No training, no experience, and after four days you were made a supervisor? Why? Mr. Weber told me that I have wonderful life. Questionable hiring is not the only problem. In the fall of 88, the Federal Aviation Administration inspects Pan Am's operation in Frankfurt and finds serious flaws. That alert security isn't tracking suspicious passengers and isn't tracking transit baggage to make sure it's x-rayed as it's transferred from one flight to another. Despite all the warning signs, Pan Am is worried about something else, money. In an internal company memo obtained by Primetime Live, a Pan Am official in Frankfurt states, for financial reasons, the security staff has to be kept to a minimum. One remarkable case of clock cutting involves these security training tapes prepared for alert employees in 1987. Not be shown unless an alert qualified instructor is present. A year later, the tape still haven't been sent overseas. Alert set of training, Alan Gore, says Pan Am won't pay for him to go to Europe to explain the video. Typically, says, of the airline's lack of support. We were constantly, constantly, throughout the system, um, being ridiculed. There was a saying that it's not alert, it's inert. Things like that. Meanwhile, security problems continue. In November, at London Heathrow Airport, alert tests itself by trying to sneak a weapon on a plane. The weapon passes through security unnoticed. Alert Vice President for Operations, Wilfred Wood, wonders about that $5 surcharge passengers are paying Pan Am, an estimated $18 million a year. Were they getting bottles of extra workers of the earth? No. They weren't. Yeah, simple as that. And Pan Am isn't the only weak link in the security chain. The Federal Aviation Administration's warning system also has problems. In 1988, the FAA issues dozens of security bulletins. But as Judd Rose tells us, most are not very useful. In the Middle East, 1988 is a year, like so many others, riddled with tension, turmoil, and tragedy. The images are stark and familiar. Assassinations, American ships attacked by enemy mines, retaliatory strikes. These incidents prompt dozens of security bulletins from the Federal Aviation Administration in 1988. The warnings going to U.S. airlines, embassies, and security officials around the world, but not to the general public. Primetime Live has obtained copies of these bulletins, which often turn out to be so vague, they're almost useless. Like this one out in September of 1988. It talks of the possibility of the hijacking of a U.S. airliner somewhere in Europe, the Middle East. Africa, Southeast Asia, or the Far East. And even when the information is more specific, it's often not based on high-level intelligence. This warning comes out in April. It talks of the possibility of Iranian hit squads posing as flight attendants on Iran air, based on a story in a London newspaper. Again and again, the focus is on hijackings, not bombing. That, says Billy Vincent, former security chief of the FAA, that is a critical error. The problem is no longer one of hijacking that's been solved. The problem is one of sabotage devices. We now know Iran agreed to pay Ahmed Jabril $10 million to destroy an American plane. Pan Am security was terribly lax. 
And the U.S. government was most concerned about hijacking, not sabotage. Coming up, how Jabril set up a decoy operation to distract attention from his real plan. Sabotage, Flight 103. It is now October, and Ahmed Jabril orders his bomb makers into action. As you're about to see, Jabril is a highly sophisticated strategist, hiding one lethal plan behind another. Once again, we are challenging. Jabril's men now begin making connections, moving supplies and ammunition. At the center of the operation, Hafez Delcamuni, Jabril's number two, who has set up safe houses, one in Frankfurt, two in the city of Neuss, just outside Dusseldorf. Another key player moved into position is Ramsey Diaz, a trusted courier. He is 30 years old, born in Israel, and a Druze Arab. Like many of his sect, he was drafted into the Israeli army. But he turned to terrorism after Israel's invasion of Lebanon. His Israeli passport allows him to travel freely in Europe. On October 13th, Kreisat begins work at this apartment complex. What he does here will come to be a major source of confusion for investigators. Later, we'll try to determine how many bombs were built and where they went. Primetime Live has learned that he builds four bombs here. He completes wiring on a fifth bomb. But then, it is handed over to the courier, Ramzi Diab. The next day, Kreisat and Delcomuni go from store to store in this neighborhood in Neuss, looking for clocks, fuses, batteries, and other materials to build more bombs. Kreisat feels the bombing will now happen in a day or two. So do the German police. On October 26, they raid this apartment and several more locations. Delcomuni, Kreisat, Diab, and 14 others are arrested. The police raid is no coincidence. They had known about Delcomuni's entire operation from the beginning because the bomb maker Marwan Kreisat was actually a spy for Jordanian intelligence, telling them everything about the plot because he no longer believed in or supported Jabril. Kreisat has never talked to any of the investigators. Today, he is at a secure location, somewhere in Jordan. In information obtained exclusively by Primetime Live, we have learned that Kreisat believed the German police raid narrowly averted a disaster, whose scope until today has never been revealed. They had a master plan. In a four-day period, they were going to carry out one of the most important terrorist acts in the 20th century. They were going to plant a bomb on an Iberia Airlines flight going from Madrid to Barcelona to Tel Aviv, on an El Al flight going to Tel Aviv. And they were also going to plant a bomb in a Frankfurt bar, usually filled with American soldiers. As the German police proudly display their hall of explosives in the raid, there is something they don't know. That the most important role of the terrorist ring they discovered was not that it worked, but that it drew attention away from Jabril's real plan to bring down an American airliner. Jabril had set up the Del Camuni operation as a smokescreen, as a distraction. He had never intended for Del Camuni to bring down Pan Am 103. From the very beginning, he had suspected Kreese that had been a spy, and therefore felt that the Del Camuni operation would never work. Sources say this explains why Jabril would bring back a man who had been inactive for 13 years because he would ultimately be expendable. He would be a useful part of the smokescreen. So while intelligence agents might have been watching the four bombs built by Kreisat, or the fifth bomb given to Ramsey Diaz, Gabriel was planning to use another bomb, a sixth bomb. And that bomb would find its way on Pan Am 103. It is now December, and with Gabriel's operation in full swing comes an ominous warning. An anonymous caller phones the American Embassy in Helsinki, Finland, warning that sometime in the next two weeks, an attempt will be made to bomb a Pan Am jet flying from Frankfurt to the United States. The Finnish police dismiss the call as a hoax. But the FAA takes it seriously enough to issue another confidential warning. When the warning arrives at the American Embassy in Moscow, officials break with diplomatic procedure and post it outside the embassy's cafeteria prompting some of those lucky enough to see it to change their travel plans. There was a real push in the embassy community to make sure that everybody was aware that there had been a terrorist threat made um, and that people flying Western carriers going through such points as Frankfurt should change their tickets. 
While this select group of people now knows of the warning, the general public is still in the dark. Even more alarming, that warning and others never make it to the people in Frankfurt who might have made a difference. Chris Wallace explains. In early December, Pan Am sends a security official to Finland to investigate the Helsinki Polar's threat to Pan Am flight. Later, in a confidential memo, James Berwick instructs Pan Am's alert security to place special emphasis on the handling of interline baggage, transferring from one carrier to another at Frankfurt Airport. Back in Frankfurt, Sabi Fook screens Pan Am passengers, including those on Flight 103. Were you aware that in December, a caller in Helsinki had warned that a Pan Am flight would be bombed in the next two weeks? No, we never heard anything about that. This is the FAA alert about the Helsinki caller. You never saw this. Right. Alert supervisor Beata Fronsky, who is responsible for posting security notices in Frankfurt, is never given the FAA warning. It wasn't in writing. There was nothing on our board and somehow it got lost. I saw it writing only after Lockerbie. I didn't know until then that it had existed. In fact, Alert Frankfurt director Ulrich Weber has received this FAA warning in early December. But his co-workers find it in a pile of papers on Weber's desk on December 22nd, the day after the bombing. Pan Am's frontline screeners also miss other warnings, like this November FAA alert. The terrorists have developed a new kind of bomb. Had you been told that radio cassette players might have been turned into bombs? The Harris F. That I only found out later. After the, after the bomb. Yeah. Did you know what Semtex is? No. It's a plastic explosive. If I just heard I don't even know that today. By mid-December, as terrorist threats increase, a Pan Am executive assures the Home Office in New York. Frankfurt is aware of threats, and extraordinary security procedures are complied with. But once again, alert workers tell a different story, saying there is no increase in staffing or change in procedure. Alert Vice President Wilfred Wood says Pan Am is more concerned about something else. Security wasn't a prime importance Pan Am. On time performance, was a prime importance Pan Am. And in front on live has learned of one more serious flaw in Frankfurt security. After Pan Am 103, Alert's head of training, Alan Gore, discovers an X-ray machine that's been broken for months. The same machine that was used to check some of the baggage put on Flight 103. To my horror, I found that the X-ray machine was inoperative. Pan American Station Management at Frankfurt evidently either ignored it or were unable to realize the importance of it. Even as airline security becomes less secure, Ahmed Jibril is preparing to strike. Four bombs have been discovered. A fifth bomb is then given to the courier, Ramzi Diaz. Even today, some officials still believe it was this fifth bomb that made its way onto the plane. But last year, primetime revealed it was the sixth bomb made by an entirely different unit loyal to Jibril that ripped apart the aircraft. We return to Pierre Sully. October 29th. It is cold and windy as Randy Diab, a key courier, makes his way out of Germany by train. He is carrying a Toshiba radio cassette, believed to be the fifth bomb. And after the Lockerbie explosion, Diab will become a main suspect as the man Jabril entrusted to place a bomb on Pan Am 103. But primetime live has learned that simply isn't true. As Ramsey Diab begins heading back to Syria, what he doesn't know is that Ahmed Jabril has concluded that he like Marwan Trisat, is a spy. As soon as Diab arrives at Damascus, Jabril's agent sees him and discovers these two forged Israeli passports, which have been obtained by a primetime live. The passports reinforce his suspicion that Diab was actually working for the Mossad, Israeli intelligence. Diab is held until after the explosion. Jabril said he was then released. The sources say he was killed as a traitor. Meanwhile, Ahmed Jabril has another operation underway to build a sixth bomb, the bomb that will bring down Pan Am 103. By the fall of 1988, that operation shifts into high gear. Jabril sends scouting teams to check out airport security systems. One team reports that Frankfurt is especially vulnerable. 
Meanwhile, the triggering devices for the sixth bomb are acquired from explosive experts in Libya. Unlike Jabil's first five bombs, built in a Toshiba radio with one speaker, bomb number six, sources say, is built in a Toshiba radio with two speakers. Late November, a Jabril agent, recruited from the Libyan Sikh service, he is sent to the island of Malta. He came to this store, Mary's house. He didn't seem to care what he bought or the size of any of the clothes. He just wanted to fill a suitcase. He even bought a jacket that the owner hadn't been able to sell for years. All of those clothes turned up in the suitcase that exploded on Pan Am 103. Sources say Jabril's agents may have checked that suitcase on an Air Malta flight which connected with Pan Am 103 in Frankfurt, although Air Malta denied it. Prime Time Live has learned that Jabril himself often has taken credit for a different way of getting the bomb on the plane. After the bombing, Jabril boasted to other terrorists that he fooled 21-year-old Holly Jafar, who died on Pan Am 103, into carrying the bomb aboard. Jafar, a Lebanese-American related to a prominent drug smuggling family, would have been accustomed to carrying packages. No questions asked. One thing is for certain, Jabril has been heard to say, when Pan Am 103 left Frankfurt, he was carrying his bomb, a bomb which killed everyone on board. We've learned about a sixth bomb and the few people who knew of an FAA warning. When we return, stories of passengers who boarded the doomed flight and the exhaustive, painstaking investigation. Also, the latest development in the case. When prime time continues, first plots and security lapses, we now turn to people who became victims of both. I'll take a look at the extraordinary police work done by the ordinary constable force in Scotland. And Diane talks to the families and friends of three passengers who were killed as they remember and relive that final day. This is London. It is December 21st, the winter solstice, the darkest day of the year. 259 names are being placed on a list of passengers and crew. Business consultant Nicholas Wright. Drama student Theodora Cohen. In the early morning hours, both are asleep. Across town, after a long night at the office, stockbroker Richie Grimaldi heads out for a drink. Grimaldi is saying goodbye to a friend and office colleague, Jay Giebler. Giebler, a newlywed, is flying to the United States, where his wife, Wendy, is making him a Christmas videotape. The Americans, a lot of them were, were flying home for Christmas, um, and we had decided on the spur of the moment to go for Christmas. Um, I don't know if it's something that we talk about with close friends that we on the other few years, but we just did. Fine, fine. We had made a deal that if anything happened to uh, anyone that uh, that the other two would take care of the family, uh, the, the, the wife and the children. Wendy's hoping that she's friendly right now. So I don't know. That's Back in London, another story unfolds. Annie Leroux and her friends from Syracuse University are together for the last night of their exchange program. I think out of eight of us, there were four people that were on the flight total that were out of this department that was up here that night. Were you staying up late to sort of sail the night? Yeah, we, well, Theo had gone to a show. Theo, Theodora Cohen, Annie's closest friend. She was a firecracker of a human being. Very, very passionate person. <laughs> I don't think there was anything that she didn't do without passion. She wasn't afraid. No, she never was. It's the, the incredible thing. I was always the one that was so afraid. All my nightmares. All of, all of About the, flying. About flying and, and planes blowing up. Those were what my nightmares were about. Um, she said, uh, you'll be all right. Everything will be just fine. And then she turned and did a jeté off the four steps and, and went into the cab and they were all... As Theodora Cohen dashes toward her taxi, 
fate is handing a reprieve to others on that passenger list. The four tops are playing London. We had made reservations to for the flight, and uh, um, someone called us to do an extra couple TV shows. We asked the well, can we take this second segment earlier because we lack because it's close to Christmas. Yes, we want to get home. It just wasn't meant to be. Whatever the intentions of Providence, on December 21st, Pan Am 103 is sitting in Frankfurt, West Germany, ready for the first leg of its journey. Passengers and luggage are loaded on board, some from connecting flights. At 4.50 p.m., the plane, at this point in 7.27, leaves for London. According to Dubriel, the bag with the bomb is on board. In London, American businessman Nicholas Bright takes a walk in the park. His wife, Eleanor, says he went out with a colleague. They spotted a newspaper headline about terrorists. James was saying to Nick, but you have to understand these people have their own agenda and they've been hurt and have lost loved ones and they have a specific reason for doing what they're doing. They have a purpose. A purpose that has now entangled Nick Bright, who arrives by cab at the airport. And so three people who have never met Nicholas Bright, Theodora Cohen, and Jay Diebler walk into the terminal here at Heathrow. And they join up with 256 other passengers and crew who are arriving here to keep their 6 o'clock appointment with 10 M103. The bags from Frankfurt are now transferred into the belly of a 747, a continuation of Pan Am 103. The Pan Am Clipper taxis toward takeoff. It is 6.25 p.m. It presses northward, flying a few minutes behind schedule. It climbs to 31,000 feet, 360 miles per hour. After 37 minutes, the plane nears the small Scottish village of Lockerbie. It is time to turn westward, out toward the Atlantic. Air controller Alan Top is on duty. And I waited for him to come out of that uh, zone of uh, silence, as you call it. And when he didn't, I started calling him, Tipper 103 at the Scottish. I tried several times, no answer. And then I looked at my other radar to see if he was still painting. And then suddenly, the Tipper 103 was no longer there. I heard the scoot by the rumble. And then went to the window and saw the scoot by the red explosion and then the sky just turned white. Completely terrifying. <laughs> There was uh, a smell of aviation fuel and uh, beds everywhere. We spent the night trying to ascertain who was alive, who was dead, and then as God began to come, we realized you know, there was a crater here. We realized that there were no survivors. This is the spot where the town of Lockerbie suffered the most. At 7.05 p.m., the wings of the aircraft crashed down right here. 80,000 gallons of aviation fuel exploded on impact. 19 homes were destroyed. 11 people in those homes were killed instantly. But the explosion that vaporizes much of this residential section is only part of the horror. About a quarter mile to the east, the main fuselage and 61 bodies slam down in a courtyard. Two miles away, the battered cockpit lands in burnt pasture land. On the ridge above the Tundergarth Church, a nightmare. 109 bodies litter the hillside. Nicholas Bright, age 32, with wife and son back in Boston, is found here, above the Tundergarth Cemetery. Theodora Cohen, 20, Syracuse University drama major, a mile away to the west, on the same ridge. Jay Giebler, 29 and newly married, is found on these hills above a local golf course. The pattern of bodies and debris immediately suggest to Scottish authorities that this is no accident. They open an investigation before dawn, based on a chilling proposition. We start with this investigation. It is murder, pure and simple, from the examination of the aircraft itself. It was uh, quite clear 
that from markings on it, that this hadn't been a depressurization, but it happened uh, unintentionally, but it had been blown out. Because of crosswinds of 120 miles an hour at 31,000 feet, the wreckage is spread over 845 square miles, all the way to the North Sea. But from the investigator's standpoint, it could have been far worse. If this tragedy had occurred some 10 or 15 minutes later, uh, what remained of the aircraft would have been somewhere over the Atlantic Ocean, and we would have uh, secured virtually nothing. Chief Constable George Esson has direct day-to-day -day control of the Lockerbie investigation. In the early days, no, it was simply shouting, um, walking in line, covering the area that was demarcated for each sector. It was an enormous logistic exercise at the time, as you can imagine. By mid-February, investigators using top-secret laboratory analysis within England, as well as in the United States, are able to reconstruct the bomb, the suitcase it was carried in, and pinpoint its location. Cargo hold 14L, just below the P on the Pan Am logo. These discoveries are based on the smallest pieces of physical evidence. Until well into high summer, there were policemen with uh, masks on, crawling through long grass, through nettle, uh, looking for small uh, details. And indeed, while they were carrying that out, to give you just one example, they found the lock of the suitcase in which the bomb was contained. The clues lead Scottish detectives to 35 countries around the world. In Malta, they question a clothing manufacturer about garments they believe were wrapped around the bomb. Could he tell them where they were sold? We have a, a ticket which we put on the clothes and it was still there. And from there, I could tell them roughly when the clothes were made and uh, where was the distribution of the clothes. Investigators had looped the clothing to the bomb after finding single threads contaminated with explosives. But a thread is something. How did you know enough to think that it might show you something? Well, we didn't when you set out and do it. But as in any inquiry, you explore every possibility that you think might be helpful to you. There have been several significant developments in the Pan Am case since our original report. The tragedy of Pan Am Flight 103 may well have been preventable. Last May, a special presidential commission confirmed much of what we reported, that obvious weaknesses in airline security were a major factor in the downing of Pan Am 103. They called for far-reaching new measures, 64 new recommendations. But only a handful have been implemented, such as standardized procedures for screening passengers and checking luggage. The Commission's report also criticized the government for having no standard policy on how to warn passengers of potential terrorist threats. Today, the government is still trying to come up with a policy. Meanwhile, some airlines have gone ahead and disclosed potential threats anyway. Both Delta and the Northwest Airlines recently publicized bomb threats against their flight. The Lockerbie investigation continues, but there have been no indictments. Still, congressional hearings continue to search for answers. This week, one hearing centered around an alleged drug enforcement operation. The terrorists took advantage of a DEA drug smuggling sting operation based at Frankfurt Airport to bypass normal security. The FBI investigated that charge and concluded there was no proof. Despite the FBI's dismissal, Pan Am filed suit last week claiming that the U.S. government withheld critical information about the so-called DEA operation, inhibiting Pan Am security. There have been newspaper reports this week that Libya may have been more involved in the bombing. As we reported, Libya bought the Semtex explosive from Czechoslovakia and made the triggers. Now there's a report that the whole operation may have been planned by Colonel Gaddafi himself. But a former CIA director of counterterrorism concurs with our conclusion that Jabril is actually the mastermind behind the bombing. Vincent Canestrero now a senior fellow at the National Strategy Information Center, says his sources tell him Jabril held a party to celebrate the downing of the plane. At that party, Aki Jabril is reported to have said the Americans are never going to figure out exactly how I did this operation. Today, Akhba Jabril is still based in Damascus, still given financial support and military protection by Syrian President Hafez al-Assad, same leader who is now a U.S. ally in Operation Desert Shield. As for the families of Pan Am victims, 
Their $1 billion lawsuit filed collectively against the airline drags on. I thought it was murdered. Murdered. And the murderers are out there walking around out there. And, and, and that's very, very difficult to live with. There has been no justice. Wendy Giebler, the widow of bond broker Jay Giebler, is attending law school. She plans to specialize in the field of aviation security. Eleanor Bright, widow of management consultant Nicholas Bright, says the second year since her husband's death has been more difficult than the first. Her three-year-old son Nick misses his father and frequently asks about him. Tomorrow, on the second anniversary of the bombing, Dan and Susan Cohen, the parents of Theodora Cohen, will join other victims' families in New York where they will demonstrate in front of the Pan Am ticket offices, reading aloud the names of those who never made it home. Martin Lewis Applebaum, 59. Rachel Mariah Edmelski, age 21. Two years later, the story of Pan Am 103 continues, and we'll continue to watch it.